All right, everybody. Just like we would if we were in class, I wanted to share some of the um, species of the day. So thank you, Rodney, for the long-eared jerboa found in China and Mongolia. Unknown lifespan, but we think about two to three years. They eat flying insects, communicate through vibrations, and those big long ears with those veins in them help cool down the blood and um, really alleviate the heat in the hot summer temperatures. Um, I'm going to let you click that YouTube video if you want to. This PowerPoint will be included with our Google Classroom posting. We also have the Dumbo octopus from Ella. Um, deep ocean octopus doesn't have an ink sac. Um, I believe the reasoning for that is that there aren't predators deep down there or there's not enough light for them to even see if they were to ink. Um, they have these big Dumbo ears that they kind of flap under the water, um, get about eight inches long typically, but apparently one was found that was six feet long. Wow. Okay. Um, so here's more images of the Dumbo octopus. And again, if you want to watch the videos, um, please do on your own time. So today we're talking about invasive species. Invasive species are non-native species um, and their introduction into an environment causes either economic, environmental harm, or both. Um, typically when an invasive species moves in and does well, it's because the native species cannot compete with that invasive species. And the cane toad frog, which you see there, we're gonna talk about that specifically later on. Um, as I said, uh, invasive species are oftentimes a threat to um, the habitat, to the biodiversity of that habitat. Right now, 42% um, of the threatened or endangered U.S. species are at risk as a result of invasive species moving into the area. Globally, 80% um, of our endangered species on our um, Earth are threatened because of invasive species that have moved in and either taken food, resources, um, predated on them as well. Um, lots of different uh, options there. So um, here's um, the causes of endangerment of threatened and endangered species according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And you can see um, if we look at these different causes, some of which we've talked about here, um, interactive with non-native species, in other words, interacting with invasive species is the number one cause of endangered animals in the U.S and plants, sorry, but we're focusing on wildlife here. So um, you've probably all heard of the dodo bird, this little three foot tall, eight, 40 pound bird, a flightless bird that lived in um, um, the Mauritius, which is an island in the Indian Ocean. Um, humans hunted and destroyed the habitat. Um, because of that, the ground nests were destroyed um, by invasive cats, rats, and pigs, which the humans brought. And again, we've got a flightless bird. It makes a ground nest. Obviously, those kinds of animals being brought in could make that kind of destruction, and they went extinct by the mid-17th century. Um, most exotic species do not survive and establish themselves because they don't have the right adaptation. So most of the time, if an animal or plant, but we're going to focus on animals, is brought into an area, it probably does, is not adapted to that area and might not do well. However, for animals that do well in new areas, they can have very extreme impacts on that new environment um, and cause what we would consider severe harm. So most exotic species don't do that well, so they don't actually become what we would consider invasive. So invasive species tend to be, that are good, that do a good job invading a new area tend to be tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions. They're a generalist, meaning they eat lots of different food sources. They don't rely on one food source. Um, they tend to compete quite aggressively for the resources that they need to survive, oftentimes out-competing na um, native species um, for things like food, water, places to live, shelter. Um, and they tend to not have natural enemies or pests in the new ecosystem. So again, because they haven't evolved in that area, um, predators um, have not evolved to kind of take advantage of that new wildlife food source. And then it, growing and reproducing rapidly definitely helps with uh, increase of population and success of an invasive species. So all different types of wildlife can be an invasive species. You can have mammals, crustaceans, amphibians, nematodes, all these listed here. Um, 
And so again, the impact in the United States alone, invasive species cost over $137 billion per year. Um, invasive species, this is including plants, so that can be weeds and seeds and trees and things that are non-native that take over, pest insects. Um, we see about 12% loss of U.S. crops each year because of invasive weeds that weren't native to an area and invasive pests. Um, that equates to about $33 billion per year of lost crop production. $500 million a year is put into pesticides to help fight against the invasives, or we would have lost even more crops. Um, disease is um, considered invasive as well, right? With the new pathogen, um, it can cause loss to plants. Oftentimes with plants, it could be a fungus. It could be um, a mold spore that wasn't native to that area that does very well living on a certain type of plant. So we estimate about $21 billion a year loss to those types of problems as well. Um, $9 billion a year loss to livestock pathogens. So illnesses, um, oftentimes viruses that are affecting livestock um, can cause death as well. Mad cow disease is one you've probably heard of before. Um, so here we're going to talk about the impacts of a lot of different invasives. These are the kind of one, things that you'd want to review before our next quiz or have ready to look at again. Um, but the European starling, if you've ever watched a YouTube video of that, if you haven't watched one, watch one. It's amazing the way that they um, fly. But these European starlings lived in massive groups um, and have serious impacts to crops, obviously. They can damage crops. Um, when we watched a video last semester, we saw birds damaging fruit and things like that. Imagine these massive swarms of birds coming in and landing in a farmer's field. It's not going to work well. Um, they're very aggressive compared to other animals. They outcompete for food sources, for nest sites, um, and they've been known to transmit at least 25 different diseases that weren't native to areas before that. So as you can see, they were native in this brown region. They have spread into these areas of um, purple as well. Um, another example of an invasive species um, is cheatgrass. Um, cheatgrass is a type of grass weed that has taken over um, the Western US, increased numbers and size of wildfires. This grass is dry and grows in dry places and burns quite well. So small sparks, it can burn very qu quickly and make it very hard to combat. And so original plants um, were not as fire prone this plant does very well, outcompetes, and increases our risks of fires, which is even worse with our climate change and the tendency for those to be more extreme anyway. Um, another animal is the nutria, a super cute little guy. This one's very wet and dirty, um, but these are a problem across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they originally came from South America. Um, they live in kind of aquatic swampy water ecosystems. So they were sold to help farmers deal with aquatic vegetation like lily pads and cattails and things like that that were popping up. Um, and so they affect the hydrology, they affect the water and how it sits and how it moves in regions. Um, so again, invasive species typically affect the ecology. Um, they can either do it through predation, through competing with um, local wildlife for resources, causing disease, and also hybridization, having different genes that kind of may allow them to adapt or kind of take over um, in a region. So this is a cool, um, not cool, but an informative kind of picture here. When we look at extinct species, what we know is that most extinctions have occurred on islands. Any ideas why? Well, islands are a little bit trapped, right? And so when you think about the uh, fact that an animal can't move for new resources, if an invasive comes in and outcompetes it, there's nowhere else for those animals to go. So when we look at the number of extinct um, species that we're aware of, both animals and plants, um, the black is ones that lived on islands. So we see like 200 um, extinct vertebrates on islands and about 60 or 70 extinct vertebrates on mainland. So again, those sort of um, separated off areas like islands are gonna see a much bigger increase in extinction, especially with the um, 
invasives. Sorry, my cat's bugging me. All right. Um, so most extinctions, like we said, are on islands. There's no ability for them to um, move along. Um, island species often don't have the same adaptations that um, whole land kind of animals have, mainly because if there weren't any predators there, they don't need to adapt a way of avoiding predators, for instance. Humans move to Hawaii, let's say, they bring house cats with them. All of a sudden, it's going to make a huge impact on the local animals that weren't used to having large predators that would eat the rodents and the birds and things like that. So on Hawaii itself, over a third of, um, I'm sorry, in the U.S., over a third of all of our endangered and threatened plants and birds reside in Hawaii. 282 of them are um, threatened in Hawaii overall, and 95% um, of those threatened endangered animals is because of invasive species that are coming in and taking odor over, both competitively, um, bringing in new disease, and like I mentioned, like with the house cat, new predators. So what we see is we've looked at how quickly we are bringing new species um, into Hawaii, and what scientists have found is that there's about, there used to be naturally just by animals kind of um, floating over for or flying into Hawaii, about one new species every 100,000 years. After the Polynesians um, came to the Hawaiian Islands, we saw about one new species every 50,000 years. Since Europeans have come, and now we have, you know, people are constantly traveling back and forth, there's about four new um, species brought to Hawaii every single year. Um, so about a thousand plant species in the last 200 years, um, about five, um, have been established um, and 5,000 have been introduced. So again, not everything invasive um, does well, but a thousand new plant species is obviously changing the native plant life that's there. So how do invasions happen? It can be intentional. Someone ships a new plant over or brings a pet with them um, or a new animal. Um, it can be hitchhikers imagining mussels on a boat, rats inside a boat, things like that. And then um, things can move and invade because of range expansion or shift. This could come from climate change or from being out competed. Maybe a bird flock somehow makes it over because they're having trouble accessing resources due to invasives where they are. Um, so that can happen as well. So with intentional introductions, um, usually when humans do it intentionally, we believe we have some type of benefit. Um, you, people might bring animals in for food or for sport, um, for sport hunting, um, might use them for biological control. Uh, we'll talk about the cane, cane toad and the mongoose in a little bit. Um, sometimes plants are brought in for restoration or house pets, friends. Um, if they become released, they can cause an impact, obviously. Um, I believe European starlings were brought for hunting um, and have done very well in a lot of places. Um, here's an example of a non-native species introduction, so an invasive species. Approximately 60 ring-necked pheasants were brought um, from China into Port Townsend, Washington in 1881. Most of them died on the way. Um, they shipped some more in 1882 and 1884. These were being shipped for hunting. Um, Ten years later, um, after their population was doing very well, um, was their first season in hunting. That very season, they took, sorry, the first day, they took 50,000 pheasants of hunting season. So obviously we started with 60 or less um, in 10 years. There was tons if they were able to shoot 50,000 in a single day. Um, so ring neck pheasants, again, originally were in um, these yellow areas that were brought into Europe and into the US for hunting and they remain to this day. They're actually South Dakota state bird. Another important case study, probably going to see it on the quiz, is the cane toad. The cane toad is a poisonous toad. Um, that's good because that means it can protect itself from predators as it invades. Um, it is a generalist diet, so again, it's flexible about what it eats, so it can do really well in a new environment that it didn't evolve in. It reproduces any time of the year, can lay thousands and tens of thousands of eggs. This is a perfect storm of an uh, invasive species that could do very well. The only thing that limits it is that it's sensitivity to cold, so they're not going to move to colder areas, but climate change is making things warmer, so it's actually expanding the range where cane toads can be. So the cane toad was introduced in Australia in 1935. 
They wanted it to control beetle pests in the sugarcane fields. They found it wasn't a very good pest control agent. Why? Because it likes to eat a lot of different things. So it didn't just specialize and focus on one. They have spread all over. And as a result, they have seen huge declines in varanids, which is a type of lizard native to Australia. Why would they see declines in lizards? Well, Australia um, is home to these lizards. Those lizards are also generalists and try to eat different things. And as I mentioned earlier, cane toads are poisonous. Um, basically, cane toads are doing better than the native frogs as well. Um, most predators will die if they consume a cane toad frog. If you watch the video linked below, you'll see some examples. But basically, in this part of a cane toad's back, it secretes a poison that will kill anything that tries to eat it. Um, this was really interesting. So the northern quoll um, is an endangered animal, small carnivorous marsupial. It eats cane toads, um, but it's susceptible to the poison. So again, it, it was natural in Australia. It was willing to eat cane toads, but having it not been something native, they hadn't evolved to avoid cane toads. They would eat the cane toads and they would die. And so the cane toads were here, but Australians wanted to prevent the extinction of these little um, guys, because they're so cute. So what they did was they actually capti um, captive bred them, and they taught them to avoid cane toads. And so they used small toads, and they put a nausea-inducing chemical on the toads, and they exposed the toads to the animal. The animal would smell these little small toads. They would feel nauseous. Um, and then they what they did is they took these animals and they put them in radio collars and they sent them into the wild. So they had been bred captive. They had tried to teach them to stay away from toads. Um, and what they found was the control um, quolls still tried to go for the toads. The ones that had been taught to stay away actually did a very good job and lived much longer and seemed to be avoiding that food source. Um, so it was pretty neat to see that they could actually teach a native animal to avoid this invasive so it wouldn't die because of it. So again, this black line shows the toads that were not taught. They were the control and the dotted line shows the ones that were taught and the daily survival, um, how many were surviving per day, uh, dramatically increased. Apparently females started off uh, a little bit more likely to succeed. I'm not sure if that's size and ability to eat cane toads, but they still improved as well. Another example um, is the Indian mongoose. This was an invasive species brought intentionally to Hawaii in 1883 um, to, as a biological control. The rats were eating sugarcane, and they knew that mongoose would eat rats, so they brought them in. Big problem. Rats are nocturnal. Mongoose are diurnal. That means rats are out at night. Mongoose are out during the day. Um, so they didn't take care of the rats. They also st still did well. They didn't have any natural predators. The mongoose started eating birds, bird eggs, reptiles, and they were a vector for rabies and leptospirosis. And so uh, besides doing $50 million a year in damages, they were also increasing illness on the island. Poor choice, people. Um, they also took um, a mongoose and introduced it in Japan in 1979. Um, they wanted it to kill this venomous snake that people were getting bitten by. Um, so they released about 30 mongoose in 1979. 20 years later, they estimated the population to be about 10,000. Um, so the goal, though, was for the mongoose to take care of the snakes. But then they were doing so well and creating other problems that they had to make an attempt at catching all the mongoose and trying to undo the invasive species they had released. Um, the government was paying trappers $18 per mongoose. Um, and spent more than $50,000 in paying trappers who were able to remove them. So the eradication of an invasive species once it gets in somewhere is nearly impossible and has very a lot of challenges. So other ways that invasives can happen is through hitchhikers. Um, as I mentioned before, you can have something stuck on the ballast of a ship. Something could accidentally be released into wildlife. Think about a zoo or something like that. Um, insects can easily travel on plants and foods, rats and mice in um, cargo, um, and with and diseases as well, like we're seeing with COVID-19 right now. Um, all of those invasive, not native to areas and can have big impacts. 
um, the Burmese python. I wonder if any of you have seen this picture before. It's been a very famous one. Um, but the Burmese python um, in the Everglades is a real problem. Um, one of the main causes of um, the Burmese python in Florida, it was from Hurricane Andrew. Um, it flooded um, warehouses and pet stores and things like that. And these snakes got out. Here's an example of a python that died while trying to ingest a massive alligator in the Everglades. Um, so really big snake eating really big prey. Obviously, they can have major impact. They eat birds and all the way up to alligators and livestock. Um, they can grow 22 feet. They're spreading rapidly through the tropical environment. Um, and as a result of these pythons, rabbits, raccoons, opossums, and bobcats all prey to this um, snake have basically disappeared from the Everglades. And obviously there's going to be impacts as a result of that. And so what they um, are predicting sort of those that Everglade po population of the Python um, is a growing problem. Um, what we're noticing here is that the curve starts off pretty extreme. And now as they run out of food, it might potentially be flattening. We'd have to look a little further to see. And also, um, but these are just the number of pythons being removed. I'm sorry, not the number that are there. So obviously, though, as they're removing more each year, it's probably because there are more and more each year. Um, the result of this high population of pythons, they're noticing the native um, animals um, in the Everglades, Everglades National Park have decreased, as I mentioned. Um, you can see rodent numbers. Um, you can see raccoons, foxes, coyote, bobcat, panthers. A lot of these um, deer even can get eaten by these things. It's pretty wild. Um, so Florida um, has plenty of other um, issues as well. So the Key Largo wood rat, rat is an endangered species they were trying to protect. The wood stork um, would f eventually move from endangered to threatened in 2014. Um, as a result of Florida putting a lot of effort and energy and money into helping these. So from 1999 to 2009, Florida spent over 1.4 million restoring wood rats, 101 million for the wood stork. Um, but part of the way they're doing that is by attacking the python issue because both of these animals have been found as python food in their stomachs when caught. So this is the big question scientists are asking now. Will Burmese pythons spread with climate change? Right now, this is where they are established. This is where they're found, okay? The Everglades and the southern tip. All of Florida, the darker gray is the area where it's possible. And with climate change, as we've talked about, we expect that heat to keep going. And so that range could continue to grow of where they could succeed. Eventually, um, these are areas where they could actually uh, survive. Um, so at the tip of Florida now, that's only the start with, um, so this is the current possible range that they could move into depending on the time of year and the weather, um, green being yes, yellow being maybe this is it in 2100. Um, so even up in Washington, we see a tiny bit that might have the conditions. Obviously they probably won't jump that far unless they are released by humans. So in 2013, the state tried something interesting and gave people python permits um, for hunting and harvesting, and they would actually have contests for who could get the heart, the largest and the biggest, um, trying to get people to get rid of these, um, of these threats. Uh, they know that they're aggressive, they're ill-tempered. Um, they actually killed two boys that had one as a pet in Canada. So these African rock pythons are another issue. Um, when they were catching them, they even found one that had fertilized eggs, which is, you know, just showing that they are doing well and able to reproduce in that area. So again, here's where they're suitable. The green area is where the rock pythons could survive right now. Um, orange is actually too hot, so to parts of Texas is safe. Um, and we're kind of close to the too wet area, and a lot of places are too cold. But again, with climate change, we expect that those habitats that they could move into will grow as well. Here's an example of a native species, I'm sorry, invasive species that moved in to replace a native species just because of natural range expansion. So if you look here, barred owls used to live in this um, number one category. Historically, they lived here. Um, in 1910 and 1940, they kind of spread into area number two, 40 to 60 into area number three, 60 to 80 down here. And so they continue to expand. And spot five um, is a problem because the spotted owl 
only lives in spot five. So obviously the barred owl is doing very well in a lot of ranges across the United States, and it's interfering um, and competing with a the spotted owl, which has a much smaller range and isn't going to do nearly as well if it is being outcompeted by this other owl. Another example is western bluebirds versus mountain bluebirds. Uh, mountain bluebirds are um, less aggressive. Western bluebirds have moved into their range. What do we think is going to happen? Well, I think the answer is obvious. The mountain bluebird is probably going to succeed. The less aggressive western bluebirds are going to slowly get threatened and potentially extinct. Vectors um, are basically a animal that can carry a disease that can go to some other animal. So it's a carrier um, that can transfer to a different species. Um, so ships can, can carry animals, and I guess not always a disease, but ships can carry animals and transfer them from one place to another. Human visitors can be a vector bringing an invasive species somewhere else. And then parasites um, can be carried from one animal to another as a vector as well. Um, this is a unique vector for invasive species in March 2011. Um, you've probably all heard about the big giant tsunami that caused the earthquake that caused the tsunami and Japanese debris got spread across the Pacific Ocean and some of it landed on our coast. Um, here is um, a 185 ton Japanese dock that landed in Washington two years later. Um, we think about 5 million tons of tsunami debris in the ocean um, still to this day. 70% um, of it sank, but 1.5 million tons of it is still floating. And so with that debris, it actually brings wildlife. Um, with the dock, um, had different animals living on it, sea stars, crabs, tube worms, seaweed. Residents of the coast were um, concerned about radiation but also we need to be concerned about the animals that came along. So these are all different organisms that were Japanese native that were found on our coast because they traveled with the debris. Um, here's things that have washed up along shores as well. This boat right here actually came washed up with fish in it, native to the Japanese waters. Um, and what scientists did is that one of the fish went to the Seaside Oregon Aquarium um, who quarantined quarantined it. The other ones were euthanized because they were worried about the ability for it to be invasive in Washington. So what do we do about invasive species? We've talked about this dingo before, the fact that dingo numbers actually um, help fox, kangaroo, rabbit, and other small mammals because dingoes control foxes and foxes would eat those. It's all about finding a kind of balance between the different animals. Um, we talk, Again, we talked about this, but how red fox numbers are higher where dingoes are absent, small mammals are higher where dingoes are present. So it's about finding that balance. Um, and feral cats. Feral cats contribute to 8% of extinctions of birds, mammals, and reptiles. Additionally, they can um, cause 10% uh, of the declines of critical endangered species. So they're very hard, especially on islands, as we said, ground nesters like the dodo bird and other species that aren't used to predators. And all of a sudden, your friendly little house cat becomes a predator that can lead them to extinction. Um, here are some rare birds that returned to a remote British island um, after a big effort to kill off feral cats. So birds that can fly leave. What we've found, um, which is kind of cool, is removing cats um, can help. Um, this island, however, had a different problem. They removed cats to protect birds, and the rabbits did so well that they took over a lot of the food sources of the birds. So it's all about finding that balance and looking at all the pictures, all the animals that are involved. So we need to be careful. They removed the cats, that, but then the rabbits degraded the habitats and the nesting environments, and it didn't help the birds after all. So what should we do about invasives? We need to educate people and get community support. We need to work on preventing um, transmission of accidental invasive species. Um, eradication, if it's going to be attempted, needs to be done early because these ones that get in there are going to hold on and do quite well. Um, we need community support and 
support from institutions. Um, once you start controlling, it needs to be ongoing. It's costly. You need to prioritize biological control and checking of animals and potential for insects and things like that at borders, especially into islands. And then you need to put work, time, and effort into reestablishing ecological systems. So what can you do? Don't spread invasives. Clean your hiking boots outside of your car before leaving an area. Don't bring in soil and everything in there back home with you. Don't bring animals, plants, agricultural products into a country illegally. Learn more. Prefer the native species. Plant native plants um, and avoid disturbing natural areas.